Hello everyone and welcome to my CompTIA A-1101 video series. In this video, I will cover part of Objective 1.4, Mobile Connectivity. We will review wireless and cellular data networks, including how to enable and disable them, the various connections starting at 2G and ending at 5G, hotspots, and then preferred roaming lists or PRL updates. We will also compare Global System for Mobile Communications, or GSM, with Code Division Multiple Access, CDMA, to finish up, we will review Bluetooth while focusing on device pairing and connectivity. Keep in mind that you can pause this video at any time if you are taking notes, and you can also download the presentation for offline use. I'll leave a link in the description. Mobile devices like smartphones, tablets, and other wearables basically exist for their convenience and their ability to connect to the internet. For example, they are great at browsing the web, taking pictures and sending them to friends and family, playing games, using apps to listen to music and watch videos, and even track your schedule. Mobile devices are able to access the data from any location as long as there is a cellular network present. However, you probably aren't using your phone to create and edit spreadsheets or even edit videos. Those types of tasks are completed quicker and more efficiently on a desktop PC or Mac. Connecting to a Wi-Fi network allows mobile devices to have access to any resource that may be present on that network, including printers for example. It also provides faster speeds in cellular and any data used does not go against the data plan. Bluetooth is designed for short range communications, especially when using a printer or connecting to earbuds to make a call or listen to music. Having the ability to make several types of connections makes mobile devices a powerful tool. We will begin with cellular networking standards. Most of the networking technologies and connections listed for the CompTIA a exam are short range. Wi-Fi and Bluetooth can extend a few hundred meters, while NFC is a very close range. However, cellular offers the longest range of any wireless networking technology today, and it's not even close. Let's start by covering the different generations of cellular networking standards. So starting with 2G, which happened basically in the 90s, they added new features like SMS and voicemail. 3G, which occurred in the early 2000s, basically allowed mobile data and allowed users to browse the internet. 4G, which happened in the 2010s, uh, basically introduced LTE, which offered faster speeds and more functionality to mobile devices. And then 5G, which was introduced in 2016, it's the fifth generation tech and allows more connectivity and faster speeds. If we go into more detail of the cellular networking standards, we can begin with 3G, which basically was created in 1998. It had a minimum download speed or download rate of 200 kilobits per second and a max of 7 megabits per second. They also introduced here GSM, Global System for Mobile Communication, which was used by AT&T and T-Mobile, and then also CDMA, Code Division Multiple Access, which was used by Sprint and Verizon. GSM and CDMA were not compatible with each other Therefore, you couldn't use a GSM-based phone on a CDMA network and vice versa. So before we move on to 4G, let's quickly compare and contrast GSM and CDMA. So first up, I think one of the big things that stands out about GSM is that it basically interferes with some of the electronics, especially in certain audio amplifiers. Um, and then with CDMA, basically every time you want to subscribe to a new provider, you must buy a new phone. The big difference between the two is that with CDMA networks, you are basically using unique identifiers programmed into each device, while GSM networks use SIM cards to authenticate the devices, and, and that allows roaming. It also allows users to use their device in different countries without changing their phone number. 4G, which was introduced in 2008, designed to use IP instead of traditional phone circuits, also introduced LTE, long-term evolution, which had download speeds of 10 to 20 megabits per second and upload speeds of 3 to 10 megabits per second. Optimal cell size was around 3.1 miles, with reasonable speeds coming at around 19 miles. Last but definitely not least is 5G. It was introduced in 2016. It offers consistent wireless speeds of around 1 gig gigabits per second with a theoretical maximum of around 20 gigabits per second. There are three 5G classifications, EMBB, which is Enhanced Mobile Broadband, Cell Phone and Mobile Communications, that's what, you know, that's what it's for, URLLC, Ultra Reliable Low Latency Communications, and that is your autonomous vehicles and industrial applications, and then MMTC, which is Massive Machine Type Communications, and that is for your sensors designed for, you know, to support IoT. Next up, let's discuss hotspots or tethering and using airplane mode. Mobile hotspots allow you to share your cellular internet connection with Wi-Fi capable devices. For example, a laptop can search for a smartphone's Wi-Fi network and then join it and then have internet. Tethering is connecting a device to a mobile hotspot. So basically you have your hotspot that sends out the signal and then you connect to it, therefore tethering. This is a convenient feature to have if you are traveling and do not have access to Wi-Fi but need to create a quick report or alter a spreadsheet. 
you can simply use your smartphone cell phone connection and then turn that into Wi-Fi for your laptop, allowing you to connect to the internet. When it comes to airplane mode, for several years, no network signals were allowed on airplanes. Today, some airlines will allow for in-flight Wi-Fi for a small fee. Airplane mode is no longer restricted to airplane use. As a matter of fact, it is mostly used today to quickly turn off all of your external connections on your cell phone. So just as your laptops and desktops have operating systems and require updates, your mobile phones also have many different types of operating systems and require updates. First off, when it comes to the operating systems, they have the main OS, which, you know, for example, would be Android or iOS. They have real-time operating systems or RTOSs, and they are very small file sizes, basically around 300 kilobytes. They have a baseband OS, which manages all of the wireless communications and is handled by a different and separate processor. Then you have your SIM OS, which manages all of the data transfers between the phone and the SIM chip. The SIM chip being a small memory chip that stores user account info, phone IDs, security data, and is usually assigned to a specific carrier. Now you also have product release instructions or PRIs, which includes configuration settings on the device specific to types of a network that is on. So does, depending on which type of network it's on, you'll get configuration settings based on that specific device. And then you have your preferred roaming list or PRL, which is a list that a phone uses to connect to the correct cell phone tower when roaming. Now we are on to the most exciting part of the presentation, and that's acronyms that you need to know for the uh, certification exam. So first up, we have International Mobile Equipment Identity, and that is IMEI. That's a 15-digit serial number that is unique to each cell phone. It can be displayed on most phones by dialing star pound zero six pound. Uh, you can also find it in settings. AT&T and T-Mobile were the first networks to use IMEI. Then we have Mobile Equipment Identifier, so MEID. That's an alternate form of a serial number. It is identical to the first 14 numbers of the IMEI. Sprint and Verizon were the first to use MEIDs. Next up, you have the International Mobile Subscriber Identity, IMSI. That is a unique 15-digit ID that describes a specific mobile user. It includes the following three values mobile country code, mobile network code, and then the mobile station identifier number. The mobile country code or MCC is a three digit code that is tied to a country. So for example, you would have 310 for US and 234 for the UK. Next, you would have mobile network code or MNC. That's a two or three digit code that identifies the carrier. Uh, in the US, you would have 006 for Verizon and then 170 and 410 that are AT&T. And then last, you would have the mobile station identifier number, MSIN, and that is a sequential serial number. The next acronym on the list would be Integrated Circuit Card Identifier, or ICCID. That is a 18 or 19 digit serial number for the SIM card. Last, we have Secure Element Identifier, SEID. That's a hexadecimal code, basically including several characters that is uniquely identifies the phone. It is used in security apps, NFC, and features like Apple Pay. Location services are technologies that use a device's geographical information to provide personalized services and information to users. It can use information from cellular, Wi-Fi, GPS, and Bluetooth networks to determine a user's location. They are often used on mobile devices, but can also be used on other devices that can provide a location, such as desktop PCs or laptops. An example of location services would be GPS, Global Positioning Systems, which is a satellite-based navigation system that provides location and time services. There are three major components to GPS. Satellite Constellation, which is basically a network of identical or similar type satellites with the same purpose and shared control. Then there is Ground Control Network, which monitors the satellite health and signal integrity. And then you have the receiver, which comes in several forms, watches, wristbands, smartphones, and tablets. Next, we actually have some hands-on type of content here, and I'm going to assume that if you're studying for this exam, you have not been living under a rock and you know how to connect either an iPhone or an Android device to the Wi-Fi, but just in case you don't, we will review it here. For an iPhone, you would open settings, tap on Wi-Fi now on the settings menu, make sure that you have Wi-Fi toggled on, and if not, go ahead and slide it to the on position, tap the name of the SSID or the wireless network that you want to join, and then once you do that, you will be required to enter the password or key for the wireless network that you plan to join. And then once you do, you will get the check mark indicating that you have joined the network. 
From there, you will tap the settings back button and then return to the previous screen and swipe up to return to the home screen. Now for Android, so you have open settings and then tap connections. Make sure that the Wi-Fi toggle switch is on. If not, you can slide it to the on position. Tap Wi-Fi to show the list of available Wi-Fi networks. Tap the name or the SSID of the wireless network you want to join. Enter the password for the network and then tap connect. The device will return to the list of Wi-Fi networks showing that it is connected. From there, you can close the settings app either by swapping up or tapping the navigation buttons to return home. The next hands-on lab that you can practice would be basically disabling cellular connectivity on your cell phone. In order to disable this on your iPhone, you're going to open settings, tap the cellular on the settings menu, and then slide the switch labeled cellular data to the off position. To keep cell data and not allow roaming onto the other networks, you can toggle it off as well. In newer versions of iOS, this is an option in the primary eSIM settings. You can also determine the connection type for voice and data, so LTE, 5G, etc., and you can configure it to low data mode. In cellular settings, you can also determine which apps have access to cellular data. So once finished, you can back out of the settings app and then swipe up to close it. Now to turn off cellular connectivity or data on your Android, you would basically open up settings and then tap connections. You would tap data usage to disable the cellular data usage, toggle the slider to the off position. You can also limit the amount of data that can be used to a specific time period. When finished, close settings by using the navigation buttons or swiping up on the home screen. Now let's discuss how to configure a VPN on each of these operating systems. A VPN, which stands for Virtual Private Network, protects its users by encrypting their data and masking their IP addresses. This hides their browsing activity, identity, and location, allowing for greater privacy and autonomy. Anyone seeking a safer and more secure online experience could benefit from using a VPN, and that is exactly why they are pretty much found and included in Android and iOS devices. Now let's go ahead and uh, walk through the steps on how to create a VPN on an iPhone. So first things first, you would open up settings, then go to general, and then VPN and device management. From there, you would create a new VPN connection by tapping add VPN configuration. Choose the security protocol type, Provide the server name and the remote ID and the authentication method and the password. The server and the client must be set to the same security protocols in order for the VPN to work. If you are connecting through a proxy server, that must be set up at this time as well. Once the VPN has been established, the connection will appear below the status toggle, basically showing you that you do have a VPN connection and that everything is good. Before going through the steps of connecting Bluetooth, let's quickly take a look at all of the benefits that Bluetooth offers. First off, it's wireless. Bluetooth allows you to connect to devices without the need of cables and wires. It's also easy to use. It's already built into many devices and is easy to activate. It doesn't require a special app or connection and can often be found in the device's shortcuts or settings. It's very low energy, especially in newer devices. It uses a lower power signal so that power doesn't drain the, the device's battery. It also includes fast data sharing and most notably used these days for sharing, you know, contact information with another person. It's very secure. Most devices will use a secure connection protocol that encrypts data to protect it from malicious attacks. It will also usually require a pin to make the connection verify, basically verifying the identity. And it is usually integrated in a lot of the smart home apps and devices, allowing for most smart home devices to communicate with each other, which can make for safer homes. So for example, Bluetooth can be used to integrate smart locks with other smart devices. In order to establish a Bluetooth connection, whether you're on iOS or Android, you're going to do the following. So first up, you're going to enable Bluetooth. Now this automatically sets up the pairing process. You're going to use your mobile device to locate and select the Bluetooth device that you want to connect to. From there, you're going to enter the Bluetooth device's passcode. And today, it is more common that you have both devices display some type of pin so that you can validate and verify that you're making the, you know, the connection with the right or the correct Bluetooth device. From there, you're going to confirm pairing on the Bluetooth device by pressing a button. And then from there, you will test connectivity. So whether that's watch a video, listen to some type of, you know, audio track or whatever, so that you make sure that you actually have connection with your Bluetooth device. That completes the first part of Objective 1.4, Wireless and Cellular Data Networks. If you have any comments or questions, drop them in the comments below, and I'll do my best to answer them for you. Once you are confident in this content, check out the exam questions that I have for you linked below. Also, I appreciate all of you watching this video, and I'll see you all in the next one.